in Italy. And of course, we also are very pleased to see a very uh, um, a, a, a large audience of experts in fields which are related to the topic of this debate. So uh, uh, we are very excited about the quality of the audience. Uh, it is testament to the quality of our speakers and to the timeliness of this debate, which is attracting a lot of interest. So we're very grateful to Suma and Daniele, who are willing to start the conversation on this topic. And the way in which we're planning to organize uh, the session um, is uh, as follows. Uh, we are going to give the floor to Suma and to Daniele for about 10 minutes each, and they will um, present some thoughts on this issue. You know, are, is the public research sector a hero or a laggard in the development of vaccines for COVID-19? What is this teaching us for science and innovation policy? What is this teaching us for the role of the university? What are the lessons that we are going to learn from this obviously very quickly evolving situation? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Musa has already done an introduction on some of these issues. So let's just move on to uh, to our speakers. And after Daniele, Suma and Daniele have had the chance to present their thoughts, I think we're going to have a debate where we are going to invite the audience to share comments uh, and ideas on the presentation. And so rather than have it as a formal Q&A, I think we'll just collect a lot of comments and ideas and we'll see what emerges, what are the interesting open questions and how we can begin to address them um, in this first, you know, uh, section, session on this uh, very timely topic. So without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Suma for uh, approximately 10 minutes. Uh, Suma, please feel free to, uh, to share your slides if you have them. Thank you. Suma, we cannot hear you. Can you please unmute your microphone? Thank you. Uh, many thanks to Federica and um, Mutu for putting this together so quickly. Um, I'm also very grateful to my colleagues at uh, Essex Business School because they agreed to co-host this. Uh, it is the last week of our term. I'm not sure how many have finally signed up, but uh, I'm really grateful to them for agreeing to do this in a joint way at uh, a very busy time for us, uh, you know, in the university. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, my my slide, uh, which you I hope you can see makes my position very clear. I, I see the public research uh, in the development uh, of COVID vaccines as the unsung heroes of the story. And if we want to name or show our heroes, then here are a few of them. Uh, there's Professor Zhang Yongzhen, who released the genetic code of the virus on January the 5th, uh, 2020, against uh, perhaps the wishes of his own government. So we don't know that, but it was an act of uh, a, a, a scientist with a great social conscience, because if he had not released the code, it was unlikely that Sarah Gilbert sitting in Oxford uh, at the Jenner Institute would have been able to design uh, a, a, vaccine, a vaccine or indeed if uh, BioNTech and Moderna would have been able to develop their mRNA vaccines or uh, Alexander Ginsberg, director of the Gamalia National Research Center in Moscow, uh, would have been able to develop the Russian Sputnik V. So I think when I'm saying heroes, I'm thinking about people like this who just saw a big humanitarian crisis and they did what they could. So all of these uh, different vaccines, the, the vaccine developed by uh, Oxford and the one developed by uh, in Sputnik V, uh, Sputnik V, use very different platforms. So they were building on science that already existed. But if you don't like the uh, face of these heroes, then let's you know you can also look at the facts. So two of the three approved vaccines, uh, Moderna and Oxford Zeneca, have public science links. So Moderna has been developed in collaboration with uh, the the Institute of uh, Virology, um, the, the the institute that's headed by Dr. Fauci in America. If you look at phase three trials, eight of the 16 vaccines have university and public research links. So all these data I'm, I'm giving you are based on the WHO trials database, and I last accessed it mid-February. 
29 of the 63 candidate vaccines in clinical trials, uh, phase one, two or three have public science links. And of course you can see that, you know, whichever uh, number you look at, these are much greater than the 20% that we uh, as innovation scholars report as collaborative innovation involving uh, firm and universities uh, based on community innovation surveys. So there's a big role for public science and it's much larger than we normally expect. This is my first point. Then if you look at the cost of the vaccines, this is very variable because it depends a lot on the platform that's being used to prepare the vaccine. mRNA platforms are much more expensive because the technology is newer. Uh, there are big production bottlenecks in this technology. But you know, the Gamalia vaccine and the Oxford vaccine are on the cheaper side. And uh, these are, of course, uh, these were produced by scientists because they wanted to do something to change the situation. So there's a direct kind of social benefit of having the university involved. As an additional competitor on the market, they bring down prices, but their own vaccines are quite uh, reasonably priced. Um, then you, uh, you, you ask yourself, OK, so why did this thing happen? It's not, of course, by science alone. Uh, Sarah Gilbert said that in her in an interview with her said that you know it was uh, decades of uh, investment in public science. She says I'm I'm going to quote her long term funding through the UKRI, adding up to more than a decade of investment has been key to developing the viral vector vaccine platform and in optimizing our manufacturing methods. This meant that all the pieces were in place for us to be able to develop a novel coronavirus vaccine at, at speed. Of course, what usually grabs the attention is the 2.6 million uh, UKRI and National Institute of Health Research rapid response grant in, in March. This was, of course, important, but it could not have succeeded without uh, the platform that was provided by, uh, you know, the decades of investment in public science. And you hear a similar story when you talk to uh, scientists in the US. Uh, who've been working on mRNA advances saying that, well, the advances in the making of synthetic proteins really accelerated in the last three years, and we wouldn't have this vaccine had those advances not been there. This is not to say that the large money provided by uh, national governments uh, in the US, UK, and also Germany, and philanthropists such as the Gates Foundation was not important. They enabled production and large scale clinical trials to happen in parallel with the vaccine uh, uh, R&D. And this, of course, uh, was very important in shortening the time for making the vaccine. There are huge parallels uh, between the race for the vaccine, uh, uh, you know, and the interwar effort in antibiotics. And I've written about it in my blog, which many of you may have read. But my main points in those, there, there are basically five points that I make in that blog. Uh, one is that the exogenous demand created by this big calamity, so similar to the, the death of soldiers, not due to war, but due to bacterial infection in the interwar after the First World War, created a, a, a sort of source of exogenous government demand who wanted to avoid those deaths. And the medical challenge that it posed focused the minds of scientists and government effort. So this big shock, if you like, um, created an incentive to focus both intellectual and financial resources. And similar to what happened during the effort in antibiotics uh, with the COVID vaccine, there's the emergence of dominant platforms that may lay the grounds for future technology development. So actually what is not really noticed that much when, when people discuss uh, COVID-19 vaccines is that there are five dominant platforms at the moment of which two are traditional approaches. So uh, you know, this, this is a very nice graphic which I found on the web. Um, so you have the killed or attenuated virus and the protein. Um, you know, these are traditional uh, approaches and um, they're being used by Chinese and Indian companies um, where the, the problem with this approach is mainly that though it is traditional and it has very little risk, it takes a long time to create this uh, inactivated virus. So that's why these uh, some of these um, um, uh, platforms have rushed uh, the, the online. They've rushed the process in the sense that 
they have created the vaccine and done the trials and you know basically vaccinated people at the same time as the phase three trials are being done. Then you have the more novel approaches. So there is the mRNA technology. There's the viral vector, which uh, Oxford, Zeneca and Johnson and Johnson are based on, where you use a, a human or chimpanzee adenovirus to carry the DNA into the host cell. You have um, directly inserting the RNA into the body so that uh, part of it so that the immune system recognizes it. So Novax, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, these companies are trying to actually look at this because this provides not only a cure for COVID-19, but also for things like cancer in the future and other immune related problems. So there has been a variety of platforms and you know it's going to lay the direction for future medical research. What's also interesting to me because I'm interested in technology and development is how new countries just like America did during the antibiotic revolution uh, new countries are seeking to stake a claim to this emerging technology. This includes China, Russia and India. And there are the same debates around the ethics of patenting public science. Uh, should there be better data disclosure? Uh, but we should also recognize that patenting actually enabled Oxford University to bargain for a lower price and so a socially better outcome. And the governments have played a role more so in pro pro procurement, much less. Uh, there's a much less directive role in production. So in the antibiotics, I think the governments marshaled the existing production capacity to produce the antibiotics. Whereas what we find now is there's more experimentation in the modes of delivery. So the government has a less dominant role in production. The world capacity for uh, manufacturing the vaccine is unevenly distributed. So global supply chains have been very important. I'll just give you a little graphic which shows this. So this is the production capacity of the world uh, as estimated by this data source Air Infinity. US leads uh, with 4.6 billion doses and followed by India, China, UK, uh, Germany and South Korea. So this gives you an idea about also why China and India have taken divergent strategies you know, in how they decide to uh, stake their claim in 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 this um, in this race. Um, there are other uh, sorts of issues that come with the different platforms. That uh, you know, though there are global supply chains, these are not uh, producing uniform bottlenecks uh, for the different technologies. So there are uh, different bottlenecks. There are some uniform bottlenecks in syringes and uh, packaging and cold supply chains, but also specific bottlenecks to do with how do you stabilize proteins, you know, uh, being able to uh, test regularly whether the virus is really inactive or active, uh, you know, in the viral vector uh, vaccines. So there are bottlenecks in production which are still being sorted out. And there's experimentation in the modes of delivery to the final uh, people who need those vaccines. So there's vaccine diplomacy by China and Russia. There's the alliance with Big Pharma, which has been practiced by the UK and US companies. And then there are also public and private ventures like COVAX, where uh, it's a partnership where you know governments um, come together to demand doses and uh, make payments and COVAX collects the supplies. Uh, I'm putting it very crudely. It is more. Uh, it's a more complicated structure, but the point is there are experimentation in modes of delivery at the level of countries and also at the level of uh, universities. So Imperial College has recently announced that it has set up uh, a social enterprise uh, in order to deliver the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that's going to produce. This is funded by venture capital. So a lot of you know things are happening in this space and. We should be very aware that this is just uh, something that I've gleaned out of newspaper headlines. Uh, we don't know how it's all going to pan out in the end, but it's exciting to see all those attempts. So um, both Federica and Muthu wanted this to be more of a debate, so I'm going to just end with some thoughts on innovation policy. First, narrowly, you know, as a someone who's interested in the economics of uh, innovation. So, you know, there is this uh, thing that's coming up, especially in the UK, where um, the vaccine seems to show the success of funding public science through the competitive grant structure. 
but increasingly government policy is moving towards uh, area type uh, structure. So this mimics the DARPA initiatives of the US. And you have to ask, you know, is this ironical or was it time for change or what? Definitely uh, the statements by the scientists seem to suggest that uh, funding public science to public grants uh, was actually very successful. And then we should ask ourselves, why, why do we want to fix something that was not broke in the first place? It's also very interesting uh, to see that, uh, you know, uh, European science has been, European public science has been very invisible. So uh, I think about something like the CERN and I think, wow, you know, that was such a big um, achievement of collaborative science. But in the vaccine case, we do not see this kind of a big approach. Uh, in the European sphere, and I think you know, uh, I, I need to ask that question because, especially, that I'm arguing against Daniele, who has so long been a votary of public R&D, uh, but he seems to think that the private sector played a bigger part. Of course, I should note that the two um, German companies, uh, CureVax and um, BioNTech, are actually. Uh, BioNTech started its life as an academic spin-off. Uh, CureVac still is an academic spin-off. Um, I think um, so, uh, you know, maybe the roots uh, of the effect of public science are different, but uh, anyway, this is something we can debate whether it's a perception or it's real. Um, then uh, another question that was really interesting for me is that not only in, in the Europe versus UK and US, but also in India, the states that were good at rolling out the testing and PPE were not actually that good at rolling out vaccine production and delivery. So it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to ask if there were different capabilities required at those two stages, you know, uh, policy capabilities. And the last question, which uh, I don't know that much about, but I want to hear more about is uh, about the precautionary principle. So precautionary principle has been a very important um, uh, sort of principle in guiding health policy in Europe. And I think also policy on agriculture, especially with biotechnology crops and things. Um, but you have to ask whether the precautionary principle is actually a handicap in the case of a medical crisis. Uh, it does open that debate that, you know, is caution making uh, uh, making Europe a little bit less uh, nimble uh, to, uh, to, to, to respond to a rapidly changing situation. A couple of other thoughts which are more related to the access of to vaccines question and I found, you know, I had, I had heard this phrase, none of us will be safe until everyone is safe. And I thought that it was actually the WHO president who said it, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised. And I think it's ironic today that, you know, it's actually Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, that made the statement that a global pandemic requires a world effort to end it. None of us will be safe until everyone is safe. So this raises the question of how will the products of technology developed in the north, in this case, the COVID vaccine, reach the poorer countries in the south. So the traditional way this has been done is through the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And uh, at the moment, you have debates around uh, patent waivers and uh, uh, you know compulsory licensing and trips uh, brought uh, to the table by South Africa and India, so the so-called CTAP proposal. At the same time, you have an opposing proposal put together by the Ottawa Group, which is to protect supply chains against protectionism. Um, there is some debate on whether, I mean, I have some uh, reservations about whether patent waivers will work. It will it'll depend very much on the platform. Um, but, you know, uh, anyway, those things are up for debate. But in the meantime, we are also seeing the emergence of uh, something like a new supranational institution. This is the COVAX. Uh, it's not at all clear what's its relation to the WTO and TRIPS architecture. Is it going to replace it? Is it going to work with it? Um, so, you know, th there is something going on, and uh, I just want to stop here. I can hear Frederica Thank getting you. restless. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop here, uh, and I hope this gives some food for thought.
a huge amount of food for thought, Suma. Uh, yeah, sorry for stopping you there, but I think you had already finished anyway. I think, uh, try, let's try, it. we've gone a little, little bit longer than 10 minutes, but I think the amount of questions you have raised are well worth, um, well worth just putting it out there for further debate. Uh, and as you can see, there is a lot to be discussed. I would like to invite Daniele. I know there is a lot of the responses in the chat to some of the, uh, the role of DARPA and of uh -huh public procurement and um, agencies like those. Um, so I think this again is uh, um, very helpful to, to, to shape further discussion. But then, let me invite Daniele to, to, to present his views now. Thank you. Daniele, we cannot hear you, so if you're ready to speak, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. I was, I, 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 I'm also having another problem. Um, can you hear me now? Mm. Yeah, the problem is that I don't manage to share my slides. We can see it. Ah, you can see my slides? Yeah. Good, it's okay. So thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, and it's very it's a pleasure to see so many old friends uh, and uh, new ones uh, into into the room. And thanks uh, to Suma for uh, a, a very interesting presentation. I'm not sure to what extent uh, I disagree with her. Let me let's see let's see what what we disagree. I mean, I definitely agree that uh, there are quite a lot of things which went well. And the first, well, the first that uh, there was a, a quick reaction of the public sector by committing money in the United States and in other countries to fund research. I, I got some doubts if this was always the best way to commit money. I will come back in a minute to that. And then there was also the willingness of the of the business sector to take the challenge very seriously and to try to you know to see what uh, could uh, could have been done. And indeed, it is remarkable that in such a short period of time, I totally agree with Suma, we managed to find not one but several several workable vaccines. These should not be given for granted. If I may introduce an argument which has a bit more of sex appeal, the vaccine for HIV has not yet been discovered after nearly 30 years, you know, and therefore, you know, we cannot give for granted that a vaccine is founded. In this case, it was founded because there was previous knowledge, but also because there was a, a rather fast response to that. And let me also say that definitely a good news that uh, there has not been uh, all the eggs in one solution only, and that as soon as shown, uh, there are different platforms uh, which have provided uh, different solutions. Uh, and if there is a problem with one of them, uh, as you know, over the last uh, week, uh, there was a challenge to one of the solution, uh, namely the AstraZeneca, then unfortunately, the concern was uh, highly exaggerated, but uh, anyhow, it's always good that there are more, uh, more solutions available for everybody. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, these are some of the vaccines which are already started to be uh, administered, which, is, which I think uh, is quite important. Now, what went wrong? And I think uh, what still is going wrong? I think there are three different stages we can take into account, the development, the manufacturing and the administration. And at each of these level, I think something can be improved in the future. And I will reverse the logical order of this chain and I will start with the last stage, namely the administration. First of all, I, you are, many of you are in the United Kingdom, I, I am in Italy. Uh, many of you already had uh, the vaccine uh, administered. I didn't, uh, and I don't know yet when uh, my vaccine will be administered. I, I need to reserve it in, um, I think, the 19th of April 
if I will manage, and it's not just an Italian problem, it's a problem of the European Union, which, as you know, is going much uh, lower than the United Kingdom and the United States. I will tell for the first time in my life, uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps Brexit was not such a bad idea, you know. I'm very sorry to say that, uh, but, uh, you know, in this case, uh, it might be that at least uh, in the case of administering the vaccine for COVID, uh, Brexit proved to be a much a, a more efficient way to do that. Uh, let me also say that in many countries, uh, at least in the European Union, <clears throat> when there is still the race to find a vaccine, the administrative capacity was not uh, encountered very well, you know. So there was a, a long period in which we were waiting while, if it was given for granted that a vaccine which would have been uh, introduced, then quite a lot of administrative structures could have been made ready in advance. And this also applies for the vaccine manufacturer, you know. For example, just to give you a case, it came known to the press that an Italian company in the north of Italy, in one of the regions, which was one of the first regions to get seriously affected by COVID-19, Lombardia, there is a company, Adyen, which has signed a contract with the Russian government to manufacture Sputnik, and then we start to manufacture Sputnik in July. And therefore, people have started to ask, how come that nobody in the Italian government or in other governments has asked you to take your productive capacity, your manufacturing capacity to generate any of the other vaccines? And they say, nobody has asked. The first to knock at our door were the uh, if I can call them the Russians. And this indeed uh, is a typical problem which shows that something went wrong. And uh, I think uh, that even now there is within Europe an underutilization of manufacturing capacity in facilities uh, which uh, could in principle uh, do that. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Good, it's okay. I'm sorry, you know, I'm a bit uh, 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 uncertain about this sort of the sort of technology so here there is a basic problem governments are committed an enormous amount of resources in order to to develop and manufacture the vaccine which is of course is fine but at a certain point it seems that there was a, a not clear idea that there was a longer chain and this chain was not just to find the, the, the vaccine, but also to manufacture the vaccine and then, you know, uh, to, uh, to administer it. And these, I think uh, it was definitely good that many grants were provided to business corporations, especially in the United States, uh, in, in, but also in the United Kingdom, in Europe and so on. I think uh, that uh, we, may, the public sector, could have signed better contracts. Better contracts in order, for example, to allow the uh, possible discover of uh, a vaccine to use the invention and to manufacture it in a variety of different facilities. And here, I mean, there is a problem of public procurement, which I think could have been definitely be improved. I move to the last part. No, sorry, not the last part. Intellectual property rights. And that's actually, I would very much know more about Suma and the other views about that. Because, of course, intellectual property rights are quite important. But at this stage, intellectual property rights are not really working yet. Because there are, of course, quite a lot of, of patents applications. But none of these patents has yet been granted, I think. I'm not sure about that, but if I consider the standard time period to get a patent, the standard period is much longer. And therefore, in this intermediary period, something better could have done, 
First of all, it could have done, as I said, in terms of draft or drafting better contracts with the companies which got the grants. And this, again, is something we, where the public administration could have done better. And, uh, and second, you know, there, there are a larger number of uh, tools, uh, and Suma has already mentioned compulsory licensing. Uh, compulsory licensing would have uh, been totally appropriate in such a condition in order to do something more useful. Last stage, uh, vaccine development. And uh, I, I think uh, I, I would like to, to see better, but I think that the business sector has been overfunded compared to the public sector. That's my general impression on, on the story. Uh, overfunded over the public sector. And this is also associated to perhaps the fact that the public infrastructures, I mean, the public research infrastructures, universities, research centers, and so on, were somehow less reactive, less quickly in order to put all their efforts on a daily basis on the new challenge. And here, I think we need to reflect about this problem because I definitely agree that there is a lot, I mean, if we have a vaccine, this is associated to decades of research carried out in the public sector, and this is fine. So basically, the business corporations have managed to plug in this knowledge, and as we must shown also on recent research carried out in China and so on. But I see here a problem that the public sector is less quick in order to divert immediately its own activities and to move into something different. Actually, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've earlier said that perhaps for the first time Brexit was not such a bad idea. I would say that perhaps communism was not such a bad idea because the closest thing of a public sector vaccine that we have found is Sputnik, carried out in the former Soviet facilities. And this is something which I think we need to reflect about that. Um, uh, my last slide, what about global governance? Global governance was a total fiasco here. And actually, you know, if you do, do it yourself is the unfortunately the lesson. Countries which decided to do it by themselves, such as Israel, to large extent the United States, or also the United Kingdom, they managed to do much better and to acquire doses and to administer the doses much quicker than other countries. More importantly, at the moment, with all these contracts, and this is something which I totally share with Suma's views, apparently, if you are rich, you get vaccinated before. If you are poor, you are the last in the queue. And apparently, some of the information I managed to um, scan from the literature is that the rich countries, which account for 13% of the world population, have rights already for 50% 50, 50 of the vaccine doses. Some estimates that they will cover about 150, 500% of their needs. So very soon, in developed countries, we will be full of vaccines full of vaccines everywhere, you know, and we won't be able to, I mean, at least uh, uh, unless each of us gets vaccinated five or six times, uh, we wouldn't know what to do. But uh, the problem administration for developing countries is still lagging behind. I originally started to be interested in vaccines 15, 20 years ago, because uh, there was a very good example, a very good example of what, what the World Health Organization did in 1971, uh, with the program for the eradication of the smallpox, which worked very well at the time there was a Cold War, and therefore the, uh, the West and the East had to work together to get clients in the South. And one of the ways in which geopolitics uh, worked at the time, they joined their forces in order to eradicate smallpox. At the moment, I haven't seen anything like that for COVID-19. And therefore, you know, this, unfortunately, 
is a serious failure for global governance. And I think the World Health Organization and other institutions for global governance should, you know, be enforced with much more powerful tools that they have got at the moment. Thank you very much. I got to you a few, a few selected references that uh, I will share the slides. Thank you very much, Daniela. This is extremely interesting as well. Well, what is emerging, what is clearly emerging from this debate is that we have way too many themes to analyze for a single event. So I'm really hoping that there will be interest in taking this forward uh, with more debate in the future as well. Um, what I can see, uh, I would like to invite, I know there is a very lively discussion in the chat now around a number of different themes. I would like to invite some comments now. I think if I can just quickly summarize some of the themes that I think are emerging from this discussion. And one of, first of all, we have the theme of government funding. So what is the appropriate model? Are we thinking competitive research, competitive grant versus the ARIA, DARPA, you know, sort of model, public procurement and sort of massive investment in specific uh, technologies? Are we, uh, and you know, are analogies um, helpful? Are, do we need analogies with what happened in the case of other grand challenges to guide our understanding? Second of all, value chain, the globalization of value chains. So are we thinking about different types of, uh, um, you know, what is the role of different global actors? Um, and, you know, what is the role of government in the different stages of the value chain upon the raised by Daniele? Should there be a role of government in thinking about, you know, expanding manufacturing beyond the value chains that big pharma traditionally rely on? Should there have been a, a role of government there? Um, the patent and intellectual property right issue, there was a lively discussion in the chat about that, and the problem of go global governance. These are just some of the few main themes which I've seen. I can see three people who are lined up to speak, to, um, who have asked to speak. So let me go in order. Uh, I think Frederick and then uh, Ian. Uh, let me let me invite uh, Frederick to speak, followed by Ian and uh, Catherine. Yes. OK, um, yeah, I I. Um... I just wanted to follow up on, on Dan Daniele's point about the, the 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 problem in Europe with the unused productive capacity, and in that light, I, um, I think the the use of state versus uh, private here as as a polarity is perhaps inappropriate. What um, I mean, the, mod the model that, that, that makes sense to me here is something that uh, Mike Best outlines very nicely in his book, How Growth Really Happens, on the uh, transformation of the production system in the United States during World War II. The production was all private before, during, and after. It was all private. But the state identified bottlenecks and basically told the companies what to do and restructured the entire manufacturing and research and development economy of the country for war purposes. And, you know, what, what I think uh, you see something actually much closer to that in the US now than you've seen in Europe. Uh, and it's it's you know it's 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 something that needs to be borne in mind for uh, sustainability purposes as well. You know, people talk about a green new deal. New deal is really the wrong uh, the wrong model. <laughs> that was an employment problem. <laughs> Whereas what we're dealing with now is not an employment problem, but a transformation of production. Thank you, Fred. This is a really uh, important uh, point. Very interesting parallel with the second one. I'd, I'd like also just to call people's attention to an article from um, yesterday's New York Times, um, which details one of the platform, I just one of the technologies, one of the publicly developed technologies in use 
in, in a large number of these vaccines. And this is just coming up in the context of the fact that apparently the US government, because it has the patent on this technology, uh, could actually tell most of these companies exactly what to do simply because they haven't been paying for this patent yet. I mean, the, and the, I mean this is um, uh, what one one of the reasons that uh, this is one of the platforms that Sumo was referring to, I think. I mean, it's simply one of the reasons this was developed. These were all developed so quickly um, is that the, the methods had been lined up in laboratories from uh, research to do with MERS a few years ago. Fred, if you could put the reference to the article in the chat, that would be very yeah, helpful. Uh, I, I, I did that at the very beginning, but that was probably oh, before most okay. people. Started, <laughs> so right. I'll put that in uh, now. Uh, I think Ian and then Catherine, uh, I don't know if the comments come up in, sorry, the hands come up in chronological order or alphabetical, so forgive me if I'm not following uh, the appropriate order, sorry. Oh, hello. Uh, this is Ian Miles. If I'm the Ian, I see I have the wrong camera on. So um, you're seeing what my knees can see rather than my face. Um, I, wa I wanted to um, make a number of points, but they're related. Um, one, <coughs> one thing is uh, I, this issue of the supply chain is very important. Um, and it's dramatic to me how little social science there has been on many of the uh, actual different industries that are involved in the supply chain. Um, so uh, as well as the uh, big pharma, we know an, an innovation policy has looked a bit at biotech research firms. Um, uh, and we have uh, a series of very important firms here, obviously. Um, uh, BioNTech, which is some sort of spin-off from the University of Mainz. Uh, Vacitech, which doesn't ever get talked about, which is a spin-off from Oxford. Sarah Gilbert was heading it at one time. She withdrew from it for obvious reasons. Um, Moderna, interesting. This reflects, uh, I mean, I think that we need to look at the cross-national differences, differences in funding, including venture capital funding, um, in um, regulations, um, uh, university uh, intellectual property rules, etc. Baydol and the like are famous because um, Moderna was clearly run, started by American academics, but it looks to me like they managed to do it completely off their own bat with venture capital rather than having any spin off relation with their university. Um, in fact, there's a very interesting article in Wired a couple of months ago about how the underlying technology was developed by a researcher at Pennsylvania who couldn't get funding. She is now working with uh, BioNTech, um, in fact. Um, but apart from the, the biotech R&D firms, which are really um, uh, only look, uh, have only been looked at as, as far as I'm aware through you know, EU competitiveness report type studies um, of funding in this sector. Um, we see several other important um, industries. There's a clinical trials industry which gets put into the same category of R&D services um, as the biotech R&D firms. But the clinical trials industry is massive. And there is a bit of a discussion um, in health ethics research generally um, about the role of this industry, but very, very limited discussion. Um, they play a, obviously a vital role um, and uh, you know, there have been a few localized controversies about how effective they've been in, uh, in uh, for example, the AstraZeneca tests and so on. Um, and then there's another sector altogether, which is the testing industry. Um, and probably several of you saw the Channel 4 program about R&X, the uh, firm that was doing testing, uh, testing of um, uh, whether we were uh, exposed to the virus, whether we had antibodies and the like and things like that. Um, and if you saw the Channel 4 documentary on it a month or so ago, um, you will have been pretty, pretty shocked <laughs> by the lack of uh, ad adequate operation of this industry. Um, so what, what we have here in, in this whole process to the, eventually, you know, it, in this country is involved the NHS, uh, fortunately, in the actual uh, end delivery um, uh, of the vaccine. 
uh, is a very complex supply chain, which I think is configured in very different ways in different countries, um, relating to public funding of research to private funding of research, especially venture capital, um, or it's absent in some places, um, and to all sorts of regulatory structures um, uh, uh, in intellectual property, but also in industry university relationships and the like. The, okay. those Oh, professor, this is a very good point about the value chains. And of course, again, if you have a reference to the Wired article, uh, we'd be happy to, 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 to have it. Uh, I, I find it very interesting that the sources that we are doing for this kind of debate are really have to be journalistic sources and not what are usual, you know, the, yeah. the kind of data that we are familiar with, uh, but uh, very interesting from the methodological viewpoint as well. Um, Catherine, uh, you had a comment as well? Uh, yes, thank you very much and thank you for the presentations. Um, I wanted to make two points. The first is that um, I think it can't, in my opinion, and I've looked at it quite uh, widely, actually, I don't think the, the fact, this wasn't accidental what's happened. I think the depth of knowledge um, is really, really important here. Um, Sarah Gilbert was working on coronaviruses all the way along and she had deep knowledge of that and obviously the genetic code specifics were released but she had the deep knowledge and could act really quickly and then um i would add to suma's list of heroes kate bingham because um again she was a really experienced biochemist who'd um, got a very successful venture capital operation, which financed biochemistry uh, startups. And she knew exactly what she was talking about. And what she did was spread the risk and used a venture capital mode of operation to back uh, up to, I think, seven to 10 different platforms and operations and forward bought. Obviously the government gave her virtually a blank check in a way. But um, she didn't take any salary for it, but she just used her expertise to um, initiate and allow other things to take their place. That was the point I wanted to make. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you, Catherine. This is interesting about the indiv specific individual's uh, role in, uh, in, uh, in the UK uh, example. It's yes, it's the UK. I think Nicola um, had a comment, uh, so uh, Nicola, please. Uh, yes, I wanted to pick up on the intellectual property point. And I think it's true that the patent side of things hasn't really kicked in yet, although I have seen there's some talk of um, some of the production patents might start to kick in. However, I do think we've seen lots of use here of trade secrets and trademarks. So the trade secrecy, I was expecting for it to turn up in the manufacturing side, and we may actually find long term that that does happen so that um, the know-how uh, and uh, intangible knowledge starts to show up there and limit the ability for generics or production in general. Um, it has certainly shown up significantly in the pre-patent information, so that's not been sh widely shared. The um, data that Suma mentioned, that's not also been widely shared. And of course, now um, the EU AstraZeneca dispute based on the confidential business information in contracts. Um, the other thing is trademarks. So clearly all of the big pharma would have found this as an opportunity to increase the value of their trademarks. Or, um, of course, some of them are risk of damaging it. But long term trademarks are often used in pharma to maintain a um, price premium over generics. And so we may also find that happens, particularly when we're talking about a drug that requires a lot of public faith and trust in the system. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up the role of different types of IP uh, beyond patents. That's also very interesting how they all play a role in that. Um, so, yeah, good point. And I think we have three more comments, and I think this is good because uh, this leaves me the time to then, uh, if we just have these three comments, and then I'll briefly give the floor back to Daniela and uh, Suma for uh, for their uh, responses or observations. So we have a comment from Klaus Meyer. Hi, I, I just wanted to give a Canadian perspective in because I realized that uh, 
people in the room are very much in, <laughs> informed by the disputes we currently have between the UK and, and the EU. Uh, Canada's situation is very simple. We don't get any from our dear neighbor and trading partner uh, because the US does not export full stop. Uh, and that is partly because the government has tied up all production capacity in the government contract. And secondly, uh, there is an export ban. So even AstraZeneca is producing something in the US, they don't export and, and even their trading partners uh, don't get anything. So if you look at the vaccination rate, which I'm following on our world in data, they make beautiful graphs there. Uh, I know a lot of people in Europe are very frustrated because you compare yourself with the UK, but um, actually Canada is be behind the U U uh, European countries. To make this, uh, the, the question I ha that's going through my mind is where do we, in this whole discussion, put in contracts where governments basically give money early in the um, process, especially US and UK government, they give substantive money, but tied into conditions that mean that the first uh, batches need to be supplied to our government. So it's a, it's a sourcing contract tied in with a research contract. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that is an essential element of mm -hmm. how the US and the UK have been able to secure the initial supplies, not just from their own facilities, but also getting access through the value chain. Now, someone made, mentioned the name Kate Bingham. I've read about, there was an article in the FT emphasizing her positive contribution, but one of the things <clears throat> That, that they have, the UK and U, US have done, create contracts, and I'll, you are the experts, I'm not really a con, a, expert in this area, but my, my impression is that these contracts are comprehensive in terms of A, investing in manufacturing capacity, very important, mm. but also securing supplies from very, along the value chain, right, further back, two to three stages back in the supply chain, which is something that in business schools we understand, but maybe government bureaucrats don't understand. So, so these type of contracts are also do they count? Should they count as um, vaccine nationalism? That's a more provocative political question. But uh, the, the issue of this contract that is research support in return for being first in line definitely feeds into the debate that we have in this forum around public versus private funding of vaccines. Mm. Just my five cents of. Thank you. Very thoughts. interesting point there. Uh, yes, very interesting. Uh, so uh, I have two comments from Shomo and Grazia. Uh, also, I know you mentioned the world of data as a source. Again, if you wanted to put the reference, uh, um, I don't know if I if I grabbed that correctly. But if you wanted to share the reference in the chat, that would also be uh, extremely helpful. Uh, Shomo? Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, yes. Hi. I'm uh, doing. I'm a PhD student at Birkbeck, uh, studying intellectual law, property law, and biotech. So this uh, pandemic has come at a very <laughs> apt time for me. But I think what was interesting in the initial uh, conversation was about the. Uh, for me, was the precautionary principle. Um, because uh, the pandemic has uh, kind of blown that, um, kind of inverted it almost. So um, the principle being lack of scientific uh, uh, certainty shouldn't pre prevent us uh, reducing harm. But this has become the opposite of lack of scientific certainty shouldn't stop us preventing harm in another way of ensuring our health kind of thing. So, uh, and that ties into... Um, notions of risk uh, and and how do we deal with risk? And I'm interested in IP law because of how regulation slows down innovation. Uh, and I think um, this, the current situation has has sort of um, shown that even more and kind of cross cut out a lot of our or, or my own um, preconceptions of of manufacturing and academia and the pace at which different things go. Um, and the other thing was uh, uh, patents are just interesting because how do you even become, uh, you know, they're, they're there for um, 
they're not there to stimulate innovation. Well, the stimulus is just there in nature right now. And how are they going to go about proving novelty, um, uh, inventive step? How, how is your vaccine uh, very different from uh, the, the field as it was before? Um, and, and obviously, they're, they're going to be able to show that it's useful. But, but this, this thing, I think, is going to come when we're not in the eye of the storm and, and IP lawyers will, will get their uh, teeth into it in a two or three years' time. But I think it has shown how, how patents are, and if I've studied patents a bit, and, and um, just how the effects are almost the opposite of what they're intended to do. Um, and um, I've got lots of other things to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you carry on. A comment from thank you very much. I think we had a comment from Grazia there as well. Uh, and then I know this was gonna uh, be difficult to keep to an hour, but after that, I think Daniele and uh, Suma and Daniele should have a chance to maybe respond to all these very interesting, um, interesting things that have been raised. Grazia, uh, thank you, Federica. Uh, I think this has been a very interesting seminar and many interesting points have been made. There is one which I would like to stress. We are talking about a public health issues. Indeed, we are talking about global, and I repeat global, public health issues. Yet, I mean, the debate, not just today, but also why, much wider debate, is not so much about how to make the response to the pandemic global, but it's now we are on to the situation of uh, uh, so-called uh, um, uh, vaccine nationalism. We are all entrenched into the idea, are, is it public versus public private sector? Is it UK? Um, is it Germany? Is it uh, Canada? Canada seems to have just heard it's a difficult position with this nationalism and so on. Now, the uh, first of all, obviously, the pandemic has not gone away and it's not going to go away anytime soon. And there will be other pandemics. What I would like to see is a debate about some kind of supranational um, institution that oversees and avoids the, the problem of vaccine nationalism or production nationalism and so on and so forth and puts the, the global health to, on top of the agenda in all this. And I wonder what Daniele and Suma think about this. Thank you. Thank you, Grat. And I wonder whether, you know, inspiring examples from the past can actually help us frame this present crisis uh, in a way that can be inspiring for the future, because it is very depressing when you see the politics taking over uh, these issues of global health. Suma and Daniele, thank you, Suma. Suma, you are mute. Me. Suma, you are mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's one of the points I made, Grazia, that there is the beginnings of a supranational institution. Of course, this is politically very charged at the moment because the developing countries like South Africa, India are going to the WTO where they have an equal say, right? And they are saying, oh, we want uh, a waiver on patents. We want to do compulsory licensing. And in the WTO, the group of countries that are uh, uh, putting up opposing proposals are this group of countries which are important in the supply chains. So WTO is still trying to work that out. Where In the middle of all of this, there is the COVAX, right? Which is like, uh, is kind of taking over as a supra uh, national institution in order to, do this north-south transfer of vaccines. Gavi worked very well. I mean, you know, people credit it with having uh, uh, eradicated polio in large parts of the world. 
I don't know that the Gavi example is good for COVID. I think that's the bit that I'm really not sure because the polio vaccine was well known, tested, tried. So there was no, there was, it was only the delivery which was the issue. And so Gavi worked very well because it put those patent contracts with manufacturing contracts. But I don't know about COVID where there's still so much uncertainty about the vaccine. So in response to your question, I think it's a situation that's still very much in flux. I mean, regarding the rest of the points, <coughs> Klaus's points about contracts, Nicola's point about trade secrecy, Catherine's point about the role of uh, depth of understanding of uh, VC capital in enabling the right investments. I think these are all like really important dimensions and I've learned a lot from hearing them. I don't really have any view on it, uh, but you know, that's how it should be because this is not supposed to be like a, it's a debate. So we, we are learning from each other. So I'll just stop here and let Daniela take the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Zoom and colleagues for all these important questions. My point is very simple. The government has an enormous amount of uh, uh, arrows that can use in an emergency situation. And indeed, uh, it's totally appropriate, uh, as Fred has done, uh, to remember the case of the Second World War, because uh, in a war, uh, governments understand that they should use uh, all these instruments, uh, and the public sector and the business sector should uh, follow the instructions. So, what are these instruments? I mean, grants, grants uh, to carry out research, and that was put there, you know. A contracts to buy doses and therefore according to the doses that you can buy you can really shift the situation and so on if there are cases as there are the case of fight there in which the company is not as not dependent on the grants of the government in order to develop the vaccine the government can still use a compulsory license and compulsory license the government can decide what is the appropriate remuneration that the business company deserve to find something useful? And therefore, you know, it's something that in Canada is particularly well developed. The compulsory license has kept alive as a technique over the last 30 or 40 years, specifically for American drugs which were not provided to the Canadian market at reasonable prices. Mm. And therefore, the Canadian government has continued over the years to use the instrument seldom, but more importantly, to use the threat of the instrument in order to force American pharmaceutical companies to be reasonable, you know? And that's, I mean, I, got, I mean, all of us know some cases. I got my friend Richard Falk, which buys some drugs in the United States for $1,000 for a flacon of this size. And the same flacon here in Italy is sold for 35 euros, you know? And every time he comes here in Italy, he has a set of this drug, you know? so. There are incredible, the pricing of pharmaceutical products uh, is uh, something which follows a, a very peculiar market strategy. And this is something which the government, especially if uh, has provided the grants, uh, and especially in an emergency, can somehow use. And uh, um, to go back, and I finish with that, about nationalism or globalism. As some of my friends know, I, I am an advocate of a cosmopolitan democracy, can you imagine? And then uh, these uh, dreamy ideas uh, had to face the reality that if you do not have your productive capacity at home, uh, you are late in saving the lives of your citizens. And this is the case of Canada. This is the case of many European countries. At this stage, this productive capacity should be left in the hands of others. Shall we wait that Putin decides to give us a Sputnik or that other corporations should, should devise that? In this case, I think in crucial issues, the productive capacity should be created. And since in 
all the European countries, there are vaccines. We are all vaccinated and there is an infrastructure to do that. At a certain point, the infrastructure should use also in the emergency. And so far, this has been much lower in the continental Europe than it has been in other countries. And this is a political problem which I think Europeans should address. My solution is not uh, uh, to replicate Brexit. My solution is to move a step forward, namely to create in, in, in the European Union the instruments which will put us in the same level of, uh, of the United Kingdom. If I may ask, how many of you in the United Kingdom got already vaccinated? Do you want to feel bad, Daniele? It's okay. I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> no, I didn't come to the United Kingdom just because uh, it's two doses. Uh, but as soon as Johnson and Johnson will arrive, uh, I, I'm the, you know, and uh, Johnson and Johnson, because you know it's uh, it's the two Johnsons give you two two shots uh, together. You know, I, I will come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Suma and Daniele, for your views and it is very clear that we have a lot of expertise in this uh, workshop today. Thank you very much to the audience for the very, very interesting contribution. I think the only way in which we can close this uh, uh, meaningfully today is to probably agree that there is need for more debate <laughs> and uh, that uh, perhaps we should think about how to facilitate that in the uh, close future. So I would like to leave the floor to Musu for some closing remarks uh, and thank you very much for your uh, um, for your attention and your participation so far. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Federica. And uh, thank first, uh, this is really, really amazing uh, discussion, scholarly debate. So this is fabulous. I, so I, before we go for the word of thank, I let me uh, quickly say a couple of things. I think even though the aim of today's debate was about public versus private. I think the debate itself highlighted a lot of really, really interesting ways in which this particular phenomenon of the development of COVID-19 vaccine could be analyzed, right? If I summarize a few of these things, like the performance of different countries uh, and also the nationalism versus globalization, uh, the, effectiveness different, uh, the effectiveness of different types of IP, and the performance at different stages of vaccine development and the effectiveness of different technologies, to name a few. I think there is a real, real gap in our knowledge uh, about uh, this particular area, and we have a lot of potential to further explore this. So this is an open invitation to everyone. Uh, let's uh, work together and try to enhance our knowledge. So please uh, uh, talk with us, uh, please continue this debate. So with this, I would like to invite Professor Claudia Girajan from Essex Business School, our uh, delighted co-host of this event. So uh, Essex Business School uh, very kindly offered to co-host this event with Birkbeck. So I, I would like to invite Claudia to uh, give a word of thank. Claudia, over to you. Thank you, Martha. Um, I would like just to say thank you to Birkbeck University for giving uh, the opportunity uh, to Essex Business School to uh, co-host uh, such a great uh, debate uh, on uh, such important issues. I think the level of participation, uh, the number of participants, I, I see many people, I, many colleagues, friends, uh, um, I think it's great to see so many in the same room uh, and uh, the level of discussion and debate has been uh, has been quite amazing. So it's, it measures the success of this event. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, obviously the speakers, uh, Suma, um, Athreye, and Daniela Kibuji um, and of, of course also the, the chair uh, Federica Rossi that was excellent uh, and uh, Matt Muthu also thanks to you for uh, facilitating all this uh, event. My impression is that uh, the issues are very serious we've, we've got a kind of duty to continue I feel that and I really hope that uh, this is not just a one-off event, but it's just the beginning of perhaps of a, of a series of events where we meet again and we discuss these issues uh, one by one. I mean, you had them at least <laughs> <laughs> one by one and try to 
to see opportunities for research, but also to uh, to kind of give uh, some uh, um, some uh, some good direction uh, for perhaps uh, the future, because these issues are clearly still ongoing and uh, uh, they're quite serious and we're all affected. And yes, Daniela have been vaccinated, I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> um, as many of us are here in, in the UK. So thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. So shall we all unmute and give a, round, a big round of applause to everybody, to our scholarly community. Thank you. And also all the brilliant Lovely. practitioners and policymakers who join us. And let's continue the debate. Uh, let's shed some light on this area. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in another seminar series like this. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>